Uh, we are now going to transition um, to our next uh, panel where I'm very pleased uh, to um, allow you to have a deep dive conversation with the authors of a new uh, education technology playbook we have out, which is really looking at what do we actually know works um, in improving uh, uh, at teaching and learning through technology that can be very informative as we think about leapfrogging and education system transformation and what um, strategies we want to sustain um, over the medium to long term. Uh, many thanks to our moderator, who is I'm going to hand over to now and we'll take it away, Jerlyn Steele, who we have invited because she's a radio talk show host at CBS, incredibly interested in inequality and solutions oriented work. But I must say, for those of you who don't know her, she is a true Renaissance woman. She is a singer, has performed at Carnegie Hall. She is um, an uh, entertainment reporter. She's also an actress. So Jerlyn, we um, are very impressed with your multidimensionality and we're very grateful to, to have you here. So over to you. Thank you. Oh my goodness, thank you so much, Rebecca. I so appreciate it. I sound so good in those words. <laughs> you are so good. <laughs> thank you. Well, I tell you, um, that conversation that you just had with the Prime Minister and Kevin and Nivershi, um was really uh, enlightening um, to realize that we're all working together across the world um, to make sure that the children are learning is really quite remarkable. So thank you for that. I am delighted to moderate this second hour of the event. We just heard incredible stories of innovation and resilience from our speakers from India, Sierra Leone, and the UK. Now, one of the goals of this conversation is to shift the debate from reopening schools as we used to prior to the pandemic to seizing the opportunity this crisis presents, which is to transform schools so all children and youth learn the schools they need to reach their full potential. In this hour, we'll talk about how education technology can be harnessed to improve student learning. Now, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, one of the co-authors of, of the Center for Universal Education's new publication, Realizing the Promise, How Can Education Technology Improve Learning for All? Emiliana Vegas is senior fellow and co-director of the Center for Universal Education at the Brookings Institution. After Emiliana's presentation, we will have a conversation with her and her two co-authors, Alejandro Ganimian, assistant professor of applied psychology and economics at New York University Steinhardt School of Culture, Education and Human Development and Frederick Rick Hess, resident scholar and director of education policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Now, please send Send us any questions that you may have via Twitter by using the hashtag transformingedu or by emailing your question to events at brookings.edu. I'll get that right. If we don't have time to answer your questions today, Q co-directors Rebecca and Emiliana will be on Twitter at 9 a.m. Eastern tomorrow for a live Q and A session. So now, let's hear from Emiliana Vegas. Thank you so much, Geraldine, for this uh, introduction. And I will turn now, uh, I will turn my screen on now so you may see my slides. So as we've been talking in the previous session, um, we are gonna hone in into how can we leverage and realize the promise of education technology to improve learning for all. Um, and I'm going to summarize very briefly what is in this report that Alejandro, Rick, and I prepared, uh, targeting uh, really ministers of education around the world, especially those in low and middle income countries, to help them really think differently about how they can employ technology to accelerate student learning, leapfrog, and really close the gaps that we observe today in learning between low-income children and youth in uh, poor countries and in, in high-income countries, but also in high-income countries like the U.S., where children from disadvantaged and poor communities are at huge disadvantages. So uh, the 
Playbook is organized into five sections. First, we have a brief introduction, setting the stage as to why we embarked in this work and why we think it is relevant, especially in today's uh, COVID and hopefully for the post-COVID world. Second, we'll describe briefly what is the framework that we are relying on um, to shift the conversation between um, what we call kind of supply-driven technology to really thinking about what are the questions that we want to address with technology to improve learning. In the third section, we talk about that diagnosis, how important it is to really understand your local context, and we provide some instruments to do that. In the fourth section, we review the evidence on how technology can really complement the work of teachers and how to play to its compar comparative advantages to accelerate learning. And finally, we discuss our prognosis, which is really a step-by-step -step guide for policymakers um, to leverage technology for learning. So let me start with our brief introduction. So when the One Laptop Per Child program started almost 20 years ago, there was this hope that it would be like a magic bullet, that if only every child could have a, a, a device, they would really have access to infinite learning opportunities. But reality has shown us that this has not really been proven to be the case. And in fact, few education technology interventions have proven to really help leapfrog learning. So we argue for a simple yet surprisingly rare approach to education technology that seeks to first understand the needs of what you're trying to achieve, what are the infrastructure components and capacities that a school system has to engage technology for learning. Second, to survey the best available evidence on interventions that match those specific conditions. And finally, that once you decide on what intervention to introduce, that it's so important to closely monitor the results before you scale them up and while you're scaling them up. Our framework is based on a, on a framework that was first developed by two very prominent education researchers in the United States, David Cohen and Deborah Ball, who argued that part of the reason why so many efforts to reform education and improve learning in the United States had failed is because they had paid insufficient attention to what they coined the instructional core. That is the interactions between learners or students, teachers or educators and content. And what we do is we enhance this framework a little bit by including as well parents who in normal times, but especially in COVID times play a very important role in mediating and helping the interactions between both learners and content as well as between learners and educators. Then we turn to the diagnosis. In the playbook, we argue that in deciding when and how to invest in education technology, systems should first understand for their own context, what are its specific needs to improve student learning. For example, there are some countries where over 70% of students are not meeting the basic proficiency levels in reading and math. And that's a very different problem to address than countries where there are high levels of inequality and you have large shares of students at both the bottom and the top ends of the distribution of learning. The second factor that um, decision makers should consider is what is the infrastructure context in their own system? We were just hearing from Minister David Senge from Sierra Leone talking about how important paper is as a, as a technology and how radio is a way in which they, in that country they can be reaching um, so many students in rural and remote areas. So that's so important and that's very different from other countries. Um, and so a lot of the interventions that have tried to introduce edtech in developing countries in particular, but also in middle and high income countries that have failed, in part it is because they haven't really deeply understood what was their infrastructure uh, context? And thirdly, what's the capacity to integrate technology in the instructional process? What, how do teachers and educators, how do school leaders and how do students and even parents engage with technology today can be a real strong uh, factor to consider in how we might get them to move um, to really use technology effectively for learning. We developed some instruments based on uh, our research of already survey instruments that exist in a number of international and national assessments of education technology. But we also advise governments to leverage their own administrative data or data that comes from these surveys if they have already participated in them. 
The fourth section of our report really focuses on a very different kind of review of the evidence of education interventions in low and middle income countries. And it's different because we really try hard to build on what we know from the learning sciences and to shift the conversation from what we see as more of a supply driven uh, review where um, a lot of the evidence is analyzed in terms of whether it's hardware or software or what types of software, but really asking what are you trying to achieve and where can education technology really play a comparative advantage vis-a-vis -vis the work of teachers, students and parents to accelerate learning. So in our understanding, there are four ways in which technology can really complement and accelerate learning. The first one in the bottom left of the slide is scaling up standardized instruction. And so, you know, we heard earlier that uh, providing radio uh, through radio uh, lessons would, is an, a very effective way in some contexts to scale up standardized instruction. In our review, we document evidence from pre-recorded lessons and also these ways of providing distance education. The second comparative advantage of technology that we identified is facilitating differentiated instruction through, for example, computer adaptive learning that really meets the student at the level in which they are in terms of their skills and helps adapt in real time so that they can continue to grow those skills. And another um, area in which we found uh, less, but uh, let's say emerging evidence, it's a more recent type of intervention given how technology and connectivity has evolved is live one-on-one -on -one tutoring, which can also help facilitate personalized or differentiated instruction. The third comparative advantage of technology is expanding opportunities for students to practice. So we know from the learning sciences that it's not enough for students to read content or to hear content through a very good lecture, for example, but really when one really comprehends and, and acquires the skills and we can act upon is when we practice and apply them to a real world problems. And so technology provides a forum whereby uh, students can access almost infinite numbers of opportunities to practice concepts that they've learned uh, in class or through um, other uh, means. And finally, technology can help increase student engagement through video tutorials or games, and in some ways making learning uh, more fun through playful activities, which we know also is a way to engage students differently and help them learn faster. So to our fifth and final section really presents five steps to realize the potential of education technology for learning. The first one is really, as you can imagine, given that uh, we provided some survey instruments, is to take stock of how your current schools, teachers, and students are engaging with technology. The second important st step is to consider how the introduction of technology may affect the instructional core, these interactions among students, teachers, and content. The third important uh, step in our view is before you even um, design an intervention is really to def define what is it that you're trying to achieve? Are you trying to move everybody to a, a, a minimum or acceptable level of, of proficiency in a certain subject? Or are you trying to reduce learning gaps? And then establish goals to know how you're doing and establish ways to assess progress against those goals and to regularly adjust and make course correction to ensure that you meet those goals. The fourth important step is to understand that how this kind of reform is approached can matter immensely for its success. And by that, what we mean is that involving educators, all the stakeholders, school leaders, teachers and students from early on in the design stage is critical to understand both their capacity as well as their uh, ability to, to engage with this uh, it proposed intervention. And if they own it, they will implement it. And finally, to communicate with a range of stakeholders, including teachers, school leaders, parents, and students about what you're intending to achieve and what you're not intending to achieve to ensure that um, you have uh, the right messages. So with that, uh, Geraldine, I'll turn it over to you and we can start our conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emiliana. 
Um, it is really quite remarkable, this report. It opened my eyes to so much more than I had considered. Educating my children, education means so much to me. And so knowing that this report could really take standardized um, learning and add to that and expand it so much more. So I'm looking forward to, to rereading and rereading this report because I think it's that important. Um, I want to start out with you, Rick, as you heard uh, Emiliana talking a moment ago. I understand that the, um, one of the reasons that the three of you came together to write this report is that you, Emiliana and Alejandro, shared the view that although technology had not delivered on its promise to transform education, it could still do so if we only thought about it differently. Why do you think, Alejandro, this approach is different and how do you hope it will shift the conversation? This is for me or for Rick? For me? It is for you, yes. Excellent, wonderful. Um, so we are hoping that it will shift the conversation in a couple of ways. One of them is by being uh, founded on a um, thorough diagnosis of the system, right? Oftentimes, what we see in terms of adoption of education technology interventions, um, particularly but not exclusively in developing countries, is that the, um, uh, the product of the moment, be that a one laptop per child or be that a Khan Academy product, is what is being taked up, uh, taken up by um, uh, school systems. Um, what we're arguing for is something that actually is trying to leverage all the data that school systems are regularly um, collecting and perhaps not fully taken advantage on to actually say, number one, what do you want to change in terms of learning? Do you want to get rid of uh, low performers? Do you want to challenge high performers? Do you want to um, uh, be able to educate children in the same classroom that have different levels of skills? Uh, whatever your needs are, you need to outline those first. Then what do you have to make that work? What is your infrastructure? What is your electricity? What is your internet connectivity? These seem like, as Amelia was saying, super simple questions. However, they are uh, the reasons why some of the highest profile uh, initiatives in education technology in some developing countries have failed. Um, and, and, and thirdly, what is the capacity of your system to adopt any technology, right? So not only do teachers know how to uh, manage education technology, what familiarity do the students have with that, but in addition to that, do they have resources at home and at school? Um, what is, how open are they to taking them up? So that's the first one, being based in a very solid diagnosis of the system. And the second one is being evidence-based, right? So this seems um, uh, quite important, especially when, um, the prevalence of certain education technology products um, seems to be determined based on uh, the publicity that they get. And also because, let's face it, governments face very strong incentives to take up reforms that might not be effective. So just distributing laptops looks like a great initiative on paper and in the newspapers and its photos, but not necessarily the most effective. In fact, sometimes it actually harms learning. So combining both these diagnoses with a, um, a candid, I would say, reading of the evidence is what we think is sort of most distinctive about the approach that we're proposing. So the challenges you must have experienced trying to diagnose these from all of these sides is challenging. We've been trying to get the diagnoses correct for many, many decades. So where do you see this report really changing things when it comes to the diagnosis? Well, I would venture to say that most school systems do jump into the uh, um, technology adoption phase without conducting a diagnosis, right? So um, one point of difference, I would say, um, with, say, for example, with respect to 10 years ago, when some of these interventions were first being adopted, is the explosion of domestic, regional, and international assessments, right? Those only not only give you a full picture of where children stand in terms of learning, um, you know, some countries have, such as the Dominican Republic, have about 80% of their children performing at the lowest two levels of PISA versus a country like Chile performs among the best in Latin America but has high levels of inequality. Those two countries have very different challenges in terms of student learning, right? But not only um, uh, the learning diagnosis, but also the student questionnaires. So in the past, over the past 10 years, we've had um, international assessments um, asking about 
the willingness of students and teachers to engage with technology, and also the degree of familiarity PISA has for the past two installments, if not more, administered a specific module that is um, uh, trying to gauge um, ICT or inter information communication technology familiarity. Um, and other um, testing organizations have launched assessments of um, technical literacy, such as the, um, uh, the international uh, 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 assessment um, organization in, in the, based in the Netherlands, right? So I do think that we have quite an explosion of data now that we've never leveraged. Um, and one more thing that I would add is we're also better at using this data now. Right. So um, one program that I hopefully um, I get some time to, to speak about um, later on, what it's basically doing is adjusting the level and the pace of the material to students' ability to engage with the material. So, you know, just like most, most people might be familiar with the SAT or the GRE, if you can answer something correctly, then you get a harder problem. If you can answer something incorrectly, then you get an easier problem. So our ability to actually not only um, use diagnostic data for the uh, system as a whole, but for individual students to be able to use the responses to arguably actually target the material to what is most helpful for them is actually quite recent and quite uh, an exciting, I would say, use of technology. Thank you so much. And Rick, I know you have a lot to say about this because you too are very engaged and very concerned about the data and how we use it to make sure that the students are gonna be better after all of this research. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a terrific, right? Because that's what this is all about in the end. Look, I think one way to think about the conversation from this morning about the challenges around the globe, what Alejandro is saying is, we need good data, but data is only helpful if you're asking the right questions. And I think one of the problems with a lot of education research is we tend to study what we can easily see rather than necessarily things that help us help kids. So for instance, um, you know, we, we know for instance that physicians are gonna be able to better treat patients if they have if they have diagnostic equipment, if they have x-ray machines. But we could spend a lot of money and buy x-ray machines for every clinic and every nurse and every doctor around the land, spend a lot of money on x-ray machines, but it might not actually be all that helpful if we were sending it to people who didn't know how they were using it, if we didn't necessarily make sure that folks knew what it was useful for and what it wasn't useful for. You could imagine us spending billions and billions of dollars on x-ray machines and having people say that medical technology doesn't work because we didn't know what it was supposed to do. So when you hear Alejandro, for instance, talking about um, assessments or, or, or online uh, instructional supports that can go up and down to help a kid, it's like watching a seven-year-old play chess against a computer. If they're watching them play you know, a, a, a video game, they're probably more likely to be playing. If it's too hard, they get frustrated and quit. If it's too easy, they get bored and stop paying attention. If you're a teacher with 25 or 30 students trying to figure out what's just that right level where it's not too hard, but not too easy, trying to play Goldilocks for 25 or 30 kids can just be unreasonable. On the other hand, what teachers are really good at is when a kid is a little frustrated, putting a hand on their shoulder. A teacher can be really good at sitting down with a child at the start of a day and saying, how come you're not, your head's not with this today? So what you hear Alejandro talking about is not that technology makes schools better or replaces teachers, but that technology lets us do things to help kids that just become um, impossible or unreasonable when we're just dumping it all on a teacher's doorstep. But the answer is not more technology. The answer is, hey, what does technology let us do that we couldn't do before. And I think what's cool about the report, and this is almost entirely a credit to Alejandro, I think, is the job he did really walking carefully through the evidence that speaks to a bunch of these ways that it can get used to help teachers and help schools do a better job solving these problems for kids. Wow, well said. Alejandro, Emiliana talked about EdTech's four comparative advantages to complement and expand teachers' work so that all students, all students can learn. If you were advising a minister of education to invest in EdTech, 
which of these would you prioritize based on your reading of the evidence? Well, I hope that you don't think I'm punching when I say that it depends, right? That, that is the main argument of our report. No single intervention is effective for all needs in all contexts. And anyone who argues otherwise is, is perhaps unfamiliar with the um, nuances of the evidence, right? So what does it depend on? Three very quick things for learning needs, infrastructure, and capacity. So let me give you some directions in which you might go depending on the needs that you might have as a school system. So you might struggle to recruit effective teachers in remote or rural areas just because you know there's not enough qualified human capital in that particular area. Well, distance education uh, seems to um, have very strong evidence um, and be consistently effective for those settings. So distance education means some teachers um, or groups of teachers is sitting in a capital city or in large urban area and they're transmitting education either live or in a pre-recorded way. Most of the evidence in this question comes from the uh, very large program, national program in Mexico called the Telesecundaria program, which seems to have improved not only educational attainment, that is a number of years that students complete in those areas, but also the long-term outcome. So how were those children um, doing once they entered into the labor market or once they entered into post-secondary education? So that's one way to go. Another way to go is you might be struggling not with recruiting effective teachers in remote areas, but with educating um, uh, heterogeneous groups of students in your classroom, right? Why would that be a problem? Well, you know, our developing countries have massively expanded access to schooling over the past two decades, which is great, but on the flip side, it means that now we have the most heterogeneous classrooms that we've had um, in our history, right? Which means that now you have a single teacher, as Rick was saying, educating 30, 40 plus students each with its own level, uh, his or her own level of um, starting ability, right? So in that case, computer assisted learning seems to be most effective, right? With the most of this evidence comes from dynamically adaptive software in India that is, as I was saying before, adjusting the level and the pace of the material to students' abilities to answer the questions correctly. Um, if you're struggling with, um, many developing countries are, with low instructional time because of short school days or teacher absences or whatever, and with lecture-based lessons where the teacher is actually explaining something rather than interacting with students directly most of the time, well, in that case, opportunities for additional practice uh, seems particularly promising, right? So most of the evidence that we have on this comes from a series of um, uh, interventions in which uh, children from um, middle and high school were given access to a math uh, remedial education software in China that they could use at home. Um, and they tested the software in, 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 in several different um, settings. So it really does depend on what your, need are, uh, your needs are, but I think um, uh, for a given level or composition of needs, there is most definitely one set of interventions that seems to um, to, 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 to come out and strongly, at least temporarily, in terms of the evidence. Um, and, and I want to highlight this evidence is not just, because um, I think that this is quite prevalent in, in ed tech, is not just when this program happens, children do better, but these evaluations that we're discussing here are evaluations that are specifically designed to determine the causal effect, the cause and effect relationship of these interventions. So we're actually quite confident that these interventions improve learning in the way that we've discussed. When you mentioned infrastructure, uh, immediately the hair on my head stands up because we know that infrastructure has been a real problem. And Rick, you can speak to this as well. As we watch all that we learn unfold, it's infrastructure that's right in the center of some of the complications. Would you agree? Well, I think so. So in developing countries, at least, we have um, a series of impact evaluations that are trying to understand if you only improve infrastructure, does that actually help children? And the answer is mostly no. And once you stop and think about it, that doesn't seem all that surprising, right? Because infrastructure or learning materials or computers are only going to be helpful to you if they affect the crucial <laughs> Uh, instructional core that Emiliana was referring to. That is the interaction between students, teachers, and the material. If you're not affecting instruction, then infrastructure itself is not going to be helpful. Now, if you combine infrastructure with better skilled teachers, and you might do so by training the teachers, you might do so by helping the teachers, as Rick was saying, you might do so by using teachers from remote locations through uh, pre-recorded lessons or live lessons, then that seems to change things, right? What, what I think, though, is 
something we should be really cautious about is sometimes we, or often or increasingly, I would say, we perceived inequalities in access to technology and we want to address that. And I think that's a very normal and caring and empathic um, thing to want to do in a school system. If we see low income children uh, with no access to computers, we think that just merely providing them with such computers is actually gonna make them learn a little bit better. Um, what we've learned is we need to do a little bit extra work, right? So we need to connect the resources to something that we think is going to change learning every day or children's daily experiences in school um, in this developing country. So it's, it's, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for improving learning outcomes. And in this particular case, we wanna make sure that this is affecting something meaningful in the instructional process, if that makes sense. Okay, Rick, here's the thing. As we know, every time we embark a upon a change in our education system, um, we have the children that are learning and uh, receiving all of this data outside of the school, away from their teachers, and then they come to the school and there's more data um, inserted. That is a real challenge because sometimes they fight each other, correct? Yeah, <laughs> yes they do. And, uh, you know, I mean, this is kind of on display right now. Any parent who's dealing with remote learning, uh, you know, my first graders downstairs right now in front of a computer. And so you've got all the stimulus and all the stuff that they have in their life most of their day. And then you stick them in front of a machine and the school says, OK, we're supposed to teach stuff and trying to figure out what that stuff is and how do you get it to the kid and how and you know, and part of the problem is trying to figure this stuff out in isolation, is if you're a school district and you've got a curriculum you're supposed to cover and you've got to run these diagnostics, what you tend to do is think about how does technology help you deliver the stuff that you're supposed to deliver to get the assessment expectations that you're in the U.S. state government around the globe, your national government is looking for. And you know, that may or may not actually be where these kids are tripping up. It may not speak to the actual challenges that they're bringing with them. And so what happens is we often wind up talking past each other. The way that schools and educators think about education technology can feel real distant from the real frustrations that kids and families and communities have, not because somebody doesn't care, but because they're speaking two different languages. Mm -hmm. Those two different languages, Emiliana, if you can um, step in here, um, it, it, it doesn't allow us to communicate as well as we need to. No matter how many um, um, gadgets we have, no matter how much data we are receiving through, from the world every second, every minute, um, the children are still s seeming to miss out, not just on the learning experience, but there are different types of learning going on every day in a schoolroom or online. And as we learned with uh, this pandemic here in the United States, um, distance learning is very difficult. Um, and how do you get the children back to doing it? If they go into the classrooms even two days a week, they still have to be at home on education technology. And how do we make sure that they continue to hold on to that and know that no matter where they go, the technology can support them, not necessarily be their be all. That's a really good question. And I think what um, this pandemic in particular, but you know, uh, kind of profound education research has shown prior to that is how important the interpersonal relationships are between students and, and their teachers and that there's no technology that can really supplant that. So even though students and teachers may not right now be able in many places to be together in person, the efforts that teachers can make to still reach out on a personal level to students using technology as simple as cell phones, you know, to just check in on them and how they're doing will go a long way to keeping them engaged in school um, and to keeping them, you know, focused when they can on the learning um, that they can access remotely or in person. So that, that factor, um, you know, as, as we were saying, both in the presentation and, and I could hear it in Alejandro's uh, and Rick's comment about, you know, when, when the ed tech, you know, when technology started changing every aspect of the economy of our own lives, the expectation was that it would solve all of the education problems. 
And we've now really come to realize how crucial teachers continue to be. And their role is really irreplaceable. And what technology can do is help teachers and help students in that process of teaching and learning, but it can't substitute either of them. <laughs> it is so true. I have to tell you, Emiliana, my oldest granddaughter, who is about to turn eight, said to me, I think my childhood is over because I can no longer be with my friends at school. I can't hug my teacher. Um, so the education technology is great, but at the same time, we need, we are sentient people. We need to feel each other. We need to be in each other's space to continue to learn together as well. Do you agree, Rick? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think this is when we, when we talk about asking the wrong questions, I think this is one place in the US, we're getting this wrong right now. So we did a pretty, school districts did a pretty abysmal job with online learning this spring. And so in too many places, the solution this fall has been, we're gonna do a lot more of it. Mm -hmm. It's McDonald's approach, like, well, we don't really have good drinks here, but we're gonna give you really big drinks. It's kind of the big gulpification uh, of education. So now you've got kindergartners, you know, I get notes from parents of kindergartners around the country who are supposed to sit in front of their computer from like 8.30 to three every day. Yeah. So not only is it, you know, your, your granddaughter's feeling like isolated and there's no hugs and there's, but instead of folks saying, wait a minute, how do we use all these technologies to get kids talking one-on-one -on -one to teachers, to have kids feel connected? Instead, it's how do we use these technologies to bombard kids and parents with a lot more emails, with more assignments, with more instructional hours? because the way we've defined education, it feels like that's what we're supposed to be doing. But again, just like what we were talking a moment ago, when we think about what your granddaughter needs, when we think about what five-year-olds and 12-year-olds really need, technology can actually help us meet those needs a little bit part way, but only if we use it real differently than thinking about killer apps and online curriculum. Mm -hmm. And Emiliana, it all starts at a different level in different communities, different neighborhoods, different towns, different states. So how in the world do we get everybody on the same, um, you know, in the same book to make sure that we're applying it, um, not necessarily at the same time, but we're applying all that we've, you've, we've learned in this report. How do we apply it to make sure that the students are receiving what they need first and foremost? I think what we try to do really, and, and, and your questions right on at the same time, it's impossible to answer because there's not one way for everybody to be on the same page. And, and that's very clear because everybody right now has different circumstances. I mean, we heard earlier uh, from the minister of Sierra Leone speaking about issues like girls getting pregnant and being banned from returning to school and that being a big challenge in that country or having areas where there's no connectivity but there are there or even electricity but families have access to radio and so it's really understanding your own context and then asking the question how can i serve kids so that they can continue learning and they can even increase their learning with the tools that I have now at my disposal, but I have to say frankly, and, and sort of as a, as a shout out to the Save Our Future campaign as well, that um, you know, Kevin Watkins was speaking about, um, you know, we have to invest more in education. It's really schools and teachers that, that forge the future of countries, not just of students um, and individuals. And so I think there's a, a clear need to prioritize education at a time when we're facing you know, obviously a health crisis that requires investment in healthcare and an economic crisis that also requires, um, you know, subsidies to families and businesses. So, you know, keeping the eye on the ball in the long term is going to be really important for our decision makers. Wow. Invest, invest, invest. Come on, Rick. You know how, what that means, right? And we have tried to define investing in education for a long time. You know this as well, Rick. And so if we are trying and we're not succeeding quite yet, then where do we need to look? Are we need, do we need to look under something that will reveal to us what we're doing wrong? We got to do something. <laughs> you know, it's funny, uh, on the first call, the, the radio uh, got its shout out. But what folks can forget in the U.S., back in the 1920s and 1930s, they said radio is going to save our educational problems. We, it's going to be the schoolhouse of the air. And like if you go back to the 1800s, people were talking about chalkboards 
and ballpoint pens is revolutionary. Like every time the folks out in like a Silicon Valley or whatever, figure out something new, we're sure that they've solved our problem for us. You know, the gentleman on the first call talking about the search for the killer app. And so, yeah, I think part of the problem is those of us in education have somehow lost our confidence that it is our job to figure out how to educate kids. It'd be as if folks that, you know, in the medical profession said, well, you know, we, we don't know how to fight COVID. So we're just going to throw up our hands and we're going to wait for somebody somewhere to come up with a laser. Like, no, 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 that's not how it works. You guys have got to drive the train and you've got to tell the tech folks what equipment's going to help you get the job done. And in education, I often feel like we've, a lot, like we've let the educators go to the caboose and the folks with the tech investment are sitting up in the engine saying, let's try this, let's try that. Look, the answer ought to be real simple. Well, what I think we, you know, Emiliana did a great job of framing out in the report was look, the answers to using tech to improve education are the exact same as any other effort to improve teaching and learning for kids. It's gotta be about the child, it's gotta be about the educator, and it's gotta be about the content, and it's gotta be about those dynamics that they're, that, that they're facing. And if we think about it that way, teachers spend a lot of time, even when we're not living through 2020, teachers spend a lot of time on things that don't help kids. They're watching kids sharpen pencils. They're listening to announcements interrupt their class. They're dealing with one craziness after another. Uh, there's a study up out of Providence, Rhode Island, which figured that teachers have more than 2,000 interruptions a year in class. Um, each, after each one of those, they got to get a bunch of nine-year-olds back on path. And meanwhile, you got kids who can't get the explanations they need, can't get the supports they need. Now, technology can help with all of this like crazy. Technology can allow teachers to take attendance in a snap. Technology can allow teachers to give kids a quick six question quiz where they can like flash the numbers up anonymous to see who gets what, who, who, and whether people understand something or not. A technology creates all of these ways to let teachers do the teaching job more effectively, more powerfully. And they let kids like Alejandro talked about before get the support they need. But when you talk to folks cooking up cool new technology apps, when you cool to the folks running procurement uh, either around the globe for nations or in the US for school systems and states, this is hardly ever the conversation you have. Instead of talking about what problem is this technology gonna let us solve for these kids and these educators, we wind up talking about which technology makes test scores go up. And as long as we're having that conversation, I think we're looking under the wrong rock. Mm. Alejandro. I think that's right on. And in, in in let me add a couple of illustrations just to um, give a sense of what Rick is talking about in, in developing countries, right? So I think one thing that we need to, that is underappreciated in this debate is the trade-offs of the adoption of technology, right? So as Emiliana, Rick, and I have mentioned, <clears throat> one of the highest profile education technology interventions was a one laptop per child um, intervention, which was adopted in Peru and many other Latin American countries in which uh, children were given a netbook that they could take home um, in some cases, and that netbook came preloaded with a host of different software. Well, um, this was not the only hardware intervention. There are other interventions, one in Romania, in which they gave kids uh, desktop computers. Uh, there's other interventions in which kids are given tablets, but the same principle applies. What do you think kids will do when given a hardware with a bunch of software? Do you think they're gonna use it for Microsoft Word and Excel or are they gonna use it for games? They're gonna use it for games in many cases, right? And, and this is very funny for us thinking about it uh, in hindsight, but these are very disadvantaged children who are already performing at very low levels of achievement. And the fact that um, uh, in some cases, the provision of this hardware actually led them to perform worse in school is a serious business, right? And we should be paying closer attention to that trade-off. The same thing um, happens with the issue of social emotional skills that uh, that Rick was was raising, right? So um, uh, uh, some of Eliana's former um, colleagues at the Inter-American Development Bank have this beautiful evaluation of a um, uh, an initiative in in Chile that actually um, uh, try to get 
kids to learn more math by um, getting them to compete against each other. So in, in different groups or different classrooms or across different schools, the, as Rick was saying, if our single objective was to increase test scores, that program was a success. Children did better in terms of test scores. Now, when you look at how children felt about learning math, it made them more anxious, right? So this is quite interesting. And, and, and the reason why I think we need to think about what are we losing <laughs> when we're trying to gain test scores, as Rick was pointing out, and also just to flag the importance of closely pilot and monitor any intervention that you're trying to adopt before you take it to scale, right? In the case of Chile, this is a very small scale program. If you can detect it and correct it um, as appropriate before you take it to scale, then, then you might have a successful program in your hands. But I think paying close attention to the trade-offs is a, is a very much an underappreciated um, question in this space. Emiliana, jump right in because, of course, you talked about gaming and gamification um, in this report. And it's important to deal with that because children leave our schools, they leave the classrooms, whether no matter how great the teacher is, they go home and their life is in front of that computer and a lot of them are playing games. So I love that Alejandro mentioned that. What say you? Well, you know, in, in, I mean, there are games and then there are games, right? So there are some uh, entrepreneurs and one of these, what do you call them, crazy apps or, or sexy apps? I can't remember, Rick, what you mentioned, but that have developed apps that are, um, that are entertaining for kids and engaging in ways that games do, but also build skills. And those are the kinds of apps that we wish all kids had access to. Uh, but of course, it's very hard if those apps aren't as entertaining as the ones that don't lead to more learning or the ones that maybe have some competitive aspect to it that increase anxiety, like the case of the Chilean uh, pilot study. And so we have to be very careful. And, and I think all in all, it goes to, you know, what is needed in this particular context? What are the main challenges for getting kids to learn and really understanding how technology can best be used? I think very simple ways to unburden the work of teachers is one way, as well as to then, you know, engage kids differently in their learning experience. Mm. Go right ahead, Rick. Uh, just two points building on what Alejandro and Emiliana just said. One, I, Emiliana nailed it on this gaming point, right? We tend to say, oh, you know, games or, look, uh, there's a whole lot of people, like say the folks who've built Fortnite, uh, who we ha should have a ton to learn from as educators about how do we use these things to get kids engaged, excited. So when we talk about that caboose in the engine, the educators ought to be driving the train but when we're thinking about how to make things entertaining, they ought to be saying, hey, you guys come show us how you do it. So a lot of times we're just not getting, you know, when we actually have figured out how to make things interesting, we'll go and sit down with a chief technology officer in a school district and you feel like you're in a movie from the 1950s and then you walk out and suddenly you're watching a kid playing with something designed by, you know, for an Xbox platform and it's incredibly fun and you're dying to have a turn. And you're like, how come we haven't brought that kind of thinking into our head? And so partly this is about, it's a cultural shift and how we think about those firewalls between what counts as education and what doesn't. And then to Alejandro's point on testing, just to make sure folks in the webinar get this right. Look, I want kids to be able to read and do math and know science, these are important things. All three of us are, uh, but we've got to make sure that we're focused on what matters. So Joel Rose, for instance, in New Classrooms has pointed out in the US that given the way we do assessments, that if you go in and you're working with eighth graders who are four or five grade levels behind, and you've got supports that help them make incredible gains, they're gaining two, three years in the course of 12 months, it doesn't show up on the tests because the tests are asking, are they at grade level? And if you've got kids who are way ahead of where they should be in a rural area of India, the state, the, the, the national test might not pick this up because what you're helping them learn, they already, already knew how to get the right answers. So tests should be one part of how we think about whether things are working. But the question should not be, did test scores go up? The question should be, are we solving problems for kids and teachers that are important to solve? I need to get two more questions in before we uh, uh, go back to Emiliana. Um, Alejandro, you have done a lot of work in developing countries. Uh, please share some 
salient ed tech interventions from these um, context and why they work to improve student learning. Sure. So um, actually dovetails very nicely with what Rick was saying. So <clears throat> one of the impact relations that I had the um, fortune to be involved with was um, there was this organization in India called Educational Initiatives, EI, um, who had developed um, this software called MindSpark. The MindSpark software is a computer adaptive software um, that actually adjusts to children's uh, learning levels and learning pace. Um, it is available in math and um, in language. It is available not just in English, but in many vernacular um, languages. It was developed over 10 years. So this is a lot of iteration that went into product development. There are uh, learning specialists in both math and language that are focusing all the time on how to improve that um, software. And in addition to that, every single time that um, uh, uh, children are using the software across all of India, then um, uh, if a specific pattern is detected, the children are interviewed to understand how the software is actually working for them. So all of this to say, this is not just uh, one of uh, the many sexy products uh, that we've discussed today, but something in which real thought went into how to improve children's experiences every day in school. Right, so we validated the software for children in grades four through nine in uh, four after-school centers in Delhi, um, in India. Um, we validated over half a school year. Okay, so what we found was very large improvements um, in the assessments that we had developed. Um, speaking to Rick's earlier point, which were targeting. Uh, very low level skills. So even though we had kids from grades four through nine, we had items that were testing grade one all the way to grade nine content, right? And the children were improving the most and they were improving a lot of times in the lower grade um, content items, right? So they were improving on basic skills. Um, interestingly, though, we also evaluated that program using the official assessments of the Delhi school system, and we didn't find those gains, right? Why? Again, because the content, the, 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 the tests from the state were at this level, our tests were at this level, right? So the children were improving in the basic skills that they needed to actually progress, but the, the official tests were not picking that up. Um, that this is a great innovation. We're very excited to, to see that um, in learning had improved uh, in both reading and um, in math um, and by a moderate to, to large amount. Um, so now my colleagues, Karthik morelli Darn at UC San Diego and Abhijit Singh at the Stockholm School of Economics are actually uh, evaluating an expanded version of the software in which the software is integrated into the school day. So no longer as an after school thing, but during the school day, if you're a math teacher, can you take your kids um, to the computer lab for one hour per day um, and help them interact with the material. Now, this might be much more challenging that you might be um, wondering, but they found very optimistic results, which I, I hear are, are forthcoming to be shared publicly. So I think this illustrates something that we're trying to convey in this report. First of all, what is your need? In this case, the need was to um, teach to children in very different levels of ability. Number two, um, how do you measure what you want? In this case, not only using the official uh, tests, which of course are appropriate, but also our own tests, which were more realistic in terms of expectations. And then thirdly, evaluate it at a small scale, see what works, and then take it up and continue to evaluate it to see if it works once you've scaled it up. So that's why I like that example, because it illustrates a lot of the points that we're trying to make in this report. Thank you so much. And of course, Rick, I really want to ask you a question. This is your last question. Um, of course, we talked in, in the report, stakeholders were talked about a lot. Really key that the stakeholders are on board with this education technology and that everyone knows exactly how this is supposed to roll out. Um, are there um, things that have been um, really effective uh, when it comes to the stakeholders and the technology getting uh, together? Um, I don't know that there's anything specific to technology. I and mean, I think we know a lot about when you actually get some buy-in. One, when a school model is launching and people like that school model, when parents, when teachers have a chance to opt in. So we saw this famously, for instance, with small schools in New York City 20 years ago. Uh, this has been one of the things that has worked around a lot of magnet or charter programs. When you're trying new pedagogies, when you're trying new tools, instead of telling 50 teachers, you shall do this, like it or not, 
it can work real nicely to say, hey, who's excited about being part of this? So that you're opting in and the same for families. So that's one. A second is making sure that actual classroom teachers and parents are part of a design team. What happens a lot when we roll out these kinds of improvement efforts is we let some smart people, we have a committee with a couple of teachers from the district um, and some tech folks, and they come up with something at the district level, and then they announce in August, this is our new strategic plan. And teachers in a school look at each other and go, first I'm hearing about it. Uh, there's real value in taking that extra 12 months and saying, hey, here's what we're thinking about. And then letting groups of teachers at each school really weigh in, talk about how it's gonna work for them working with parents. And look, I mean, I think a third thing is making sure that these plans are not, here's what we hope to accomplish, but here's why we think this is gonna help kids and teachers. Are we wrong? So one of the things I have found real useful when I work with, at least in the US context with school districts, is if you can get them to start the rollout not by saying, here's what we're gonna do because it's gonna move test scores, but saying, here's what we think we're gonna do. We're hoping to help you guys, are we right? It gives people room to have, start that open conversation about whether they think you got it all wrong to start. It does. And, and of course, Emiliana is gonna to speak to that because Emiliana, why was tackling this topic important for the Center for Universal Education? And what are you planning for the next steps? Well, Geraldine, thank you, first of all, um, to you and to Alejandro and Rick for this really exciting conversation. Um, you know, at, at our Brookings Center for Universal Education, we really work to help improve education systems across the world with an eye, especially for students who are falling most behind. And those tend to be students who come from the poorest and most disadvantaged backgrounds. And so that's why we felt like it was important um, to reach out to people as brilliant as Rick and Alejandro to work with us to help inform this debate on technology and help us understand and help really policymakers and decision makers understand why, um, unlike many other sectors of you know the economy and our own like regular lives, technology had not really transformed education and how we can think about it differently. And so moving forward, you know we have a longstanding agenda on how to help. Uh, education systems make what we call um, nonlinear change or leapfrog so that they don't follow the same trajectories of what are today's high performing education systems, only because the majority of today's high performing education systems took at least 20 to 25 years to get where they are. And we don't think we have the time for today's cohorts of young uh, children in Africa, for example, who represent, you know, over 50, 60 percent of the population of that continent to wait, you know, another 20 years to have the right learning opportunities for them to get the skills they need to contribute and reach their full potential. So we're we're really seeking out these um, opportunities and, and what the research says are ways in which you can uh, accelerate change. Um, and so that's where we're, we'll continue going forward. Uh, we have a long agenda, not only on technology, but also looking at how to involve parents in innovation, realizing that they too are a very important stakeholder. And of course, working with teachers and um, you know, not just in the education sector, but also other policymakers, for example, secretaries of finance and uh, heads of state who, you know, we heard earlier the prime minister from Greece talking about how education should uh, really drive the recovery and, and be a, a, the great equalizer. Um, and uh, we heard, you know, all of the previous speakers really talking about how important it is to get this message out, not just to ministers of education, which are, of course, our original target audience, but also heads of state who ultimately will be driving these changes. So we're hoping to do a lot more of that. And so any help you all can give us to help get the word out. We have put all these materials in various formats from the report itself, um, which looks lengthier than it is because it has some very uh, good pictures and, and graphics, thanks to our wonderful graphic designer. Um, but also we have a podcast that our colleague from Brookings Cafeteria recorded. We have blogs both that Rick and Alejandro and I have, have put out and, and videos. So there's a lot of ways in which we're trying to get the word out and, and we're asking all of you to help us and, and meet us tomorrow at nine o'clock for um, a Twitter chat uh, at the hashtag transforming EDU. 
and nine o'clock. So we look forward to continuing the conversation. This is only a beginning and we hope to continue involving all of you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julian. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.